want to talk about the ways in which I think London has, has been sensorially divided as part of its history. I mean, we all know, I don't know if we all do all know actually, but um, <laughs> um, the East End is the East End for a very good reason. You know, historic, the prevailing winds blow over London from west to east, right? That's, 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 so historically, uh, the, the, ever since the Romans first settled, and they took these, uh, these principles from Persian builders actually, which then became the kind of Vitruvian principles for building cities, and they, they implemented them in London. And you know, for a long part of its history, since the Romans first put the tanneries and the, and the ditches and the cemeteries over in the east, the East End has always been sensorially marked as distinct from the West. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a kind of an ontological kind of uh, fact of London's existence. Um, and you know, this is exacerbated massively in the 19th century with the arrival of um, sea coal and, the, and, and, and steam, the coal-driven industry. And, um, Actually, I mean, I've discovered very recently, Karl Marx is really in vogue again, right? And um, <laughs> Karl Marx was actually like a really sensorially attuned um, economic historian. <laughs> and if, if you read uh, Capital and his descriptions of the, of, the, of, the, of the mills and the furnaces and the heat and the, and, and, and the, and the conditions there, there's a real sense that you know, Karl Marx's thinking is very much about the ways in which what of the, the sensory experience or the sensory lack of experience, the sensory deprivation, the, the impoverished sen sensory quality of the city's east uh, makes possible the refined airs of West London. Uh, yeah, this is um, a, a, a game for a picture of uh, St James's Park. You know, and a lot of the kind of developments around West London, the development of, of, of London's parks, was about kind of partly about creating a. Um, a, a, a um, a sensorium that's entirely distinct and actually, you know, partitioned off and separate and protected from um, the miasmic stench of the um, of the of the industrial east. Now, miasma theory sort of, you know, went out with with, with uh, John Snow's discovery of, of um, bacteria and germs, and um, to a certain certain extent, industry also drifted overseas, right? This, this smog is now found all over you know, Delhi or you know, and, and Beijing or wherever. But and on the surface, it might seem like you know, London now is just this kind of postmodern melange of different sensory atmospheres that are all you know, a product of each of our own individual unique uh, consumption practices. Uh, but we're not unique and beautiful snowflakes, and what we do fits into patterns. Um, and what I'm really interested in is actually the ways in which the, these kind of multi-sensory ambiances of different neighbourhoods in London continue to play into the socio-economic stratification of the city. Um, I'm not going to talk just about, because uh, this is about Whitechapel, and I've lived in Whitechapel for 13 years, and a lot of my research has been in on and around Whitechapel, so, so I've kind of been looking at this um, in this area for quite some time. And the first place that I, this is where I did my PhD, or a large part of my PhD. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a um, seafood stand. Um, I did a two year um, ethnography here with the, the stand's owner, Paul Simpson. Um, and it was, a, it was a study of the relationship between a particular type of space and the social formations that are associated with it. Um, I chose this particular location, Tubby Isaac Seafood Stand, established 1919, because it seemed emblematic of a particular type of space in London that was um, that's all but gone now, actually. I mean, in fact, Tubby Isaacs closed down in um, 2013. It was, um, it was an incredibly sad day in, in many respects. Um, but what I expected to find around here, and one of the reasons I chose it was because I really had in my mind that what, what I'd find in the kind of daily congregation of taxi drivers and street cleaners and the such like around these, these kind of squishy eels and these little cockles was the articulation of a, a very exclusive white working class masculinity. Um, and I, I was interested in the ways in which a particular kind of sensory experience, a set of culinary practices, a particular ambiance um, kind of fed into that. And to a certain extent, it, you know, that is what I found, and there's a real kind of hot sense in which some of the patrons saw this as like the last island of an island race being kind of lapped up by the, by the waves of globalisation. But actually, kind of beyond that, if you scratch the surface a little bit, the, the 
differences between the people that arrived at this stand to, to eat there was, uh, was pretty remarkable. And you had kind of everyday convivial multiculture taking place there. So you'd get African women coming down from Petticoat Lane Market and they'd bring this special um, uh, chili pepper sauce that they cooked at home. And seafood, shellfish is really, really big on the west coast of Africa. And this is where they came to kind of source their um, uh, fresh seafood. Likewise, there was a, there was a young lad from... Um, um, uh, from Iraq, who uh, um, he, you know, he, he left in the first Gulf War, and he kind of he went there because he had a real affinity with seafood as well, partly from his childhood, partly through the the, the food that he associated with the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, suffice to say that it's a marginal place. It's it, it's very much kind of not part of the rest of the city. But I think one of the things that enabled was for other things that are marginal, identities that are marginal, practices that are marginal, professions that are marginal, street cleaners, sex workers early in the morning. You know, they kind of congregate around this particular place and they talk across difference and they communicated across difference. Or, you know, there was some incredibly profane banter and you know, lots of casual xenophobia there as well, I'm not denying that, but actually it was a very, very important um, social space. Jelly deals. <laughs> I, I could talk a lot about jelly deals. Um, yes, uh, so the, oh, the other important thing that I just want to say um, about Toby Isaacs is that um, it was also a really important space in terms of intergenerational um, interaction. So at Christmas, Christmas was always the busiest time for Toby Isaacs, and it was a time when um, uh, like young, oh, well, young -ish, um, uh, children of people who had left London in the last wave of displacement in the kind of 60s and the, and the and 50s and 60s that Young and Wilmot wrote about, um, they, they would come back with their parents who had been, you know, had left the East End for Essex and the home counties in the 50s and the 60s, and they'd come back to visit Petticoat Lane at Christmas and to have um, some cockles and welts and to visit the graves of relatives in Tower Hamlet, Tower Hamlet Cemetery. And it was a really important place for kind of playing out generational identities, for saying, actually, I'm different from you, or I'm the same as you. Some people would go out of their way to order exactly the same thing as their, as their parents did, and others would just kind of stand back and, like, you can imagine how disgusted some people are at this. And that was really a part of saying, well, I'm not that white working class cockney that you were, Dad or Mum. And, sorry, this is just about um, the role of... Uh, um, and... I guess I've kind of continued on this particular theme um, um, in, in my, more, my more recent work. I've become really, really interested in the various kind of sociological stories um, you can play, particularly with, uh, that you can tell, particularly with relationships to the fried chicken shop, um, Formica-clad village square. There are six, seven of these on Whitechapel Road, seven uh, fried chicken shops. Um, and I think that they are really fascinating spaces for so many reasons. Firstly, they play a very important social role, cultural role for the young people that use them. And it's primarily young people um, that use them. There is an identity that is produced, or that is allowed to be produced in these particular types of spaces, and youth clubs and the public spaces in and around Whitechapel Road, but fried chicken shops in particular. It's an identity that's transnational. It's distinct quite often from their parents and their grandparents' identity. Um, but you know, and, and it's very much of the East End or of um, of, of Whitechapel. Also, and you may all, I mean, I don't know how you all feel about um, uh, fried chicken, but on property development websites, you know, they they give details as to how much you can make if you buy a fried chicken shop and de fried chicken it, basically. And it's about 175 grand on a 400 grand property you can make. So, um, and you know, that is. Which is to say that a fried chicken shop can take um, 125 grand off a 400 grand property. Uh, partly because of the social ecology that we associate with fried chicken shops. I mean, they, they are, it's one of those, what we might refer to as a taste of necessity. The most amount of calories for the least money possible. Therefore, it is, you know, a part of poverty. But it's also a set of flavours and tastes that, that actually mean something to the young people that go there. It's a really, really big part of their lives. I doubt any of you are into the grime scene, but there's a great song a couple of years ago called Junior Spech, which was a celebration of the £1.20 Junior Spech, which is a wing and, um, and a um, portion of Coke. Um, but they are, they're maligned. You know, they're really, really maligned. And uh, perhaps rightly so, because there's an incredibly high density of them. Town councils now have the ability to restrict the fried chicken shops that are built in particular areas, um, partly 
for health reasons, right? I mean, there was a case in Tower Hamlets, I, I'm sorry, I'm just pointing, but uh, there was a case in Tower Hamlets where a fried chicken shop wasn't allowed to be built um, around very close to a school um, for health reasons. Now, the evidence that correlates proximity of hot food takeaways to childhood morbidity is really, really problematic because uh, it doesn't take proximity of hot food. Uh, you can't isolate that variable out of poverty. Like there's, there's an ecology of poverty that it's part of that may well produce childhood morbidity. But um, uh, yeah, no. Um, it's just a quotation uh, from, from the paper from about fried chicken. You smell it before you see it. The sickly sweet salty tang of deep fried cheap chicken chunklets. Uh, you probably spy the packaging later, squashed under a bus stop on your way home. Frequently, it'll lie next to the remnants of that fried chicken, bathing, reconstituted by a drunken human stomach. And anyway, you've all just had lunch. Um, <laughs> this is from a newspaper, but also if you read a planning consultation documents or uh, you know around the redevelopment of Dalston or some of the areas in Hackney and Tower Hamlets, a lot of the quite often you'll find kind of residents complain newer residents in the area. <laughs> Uh, complaining about uh, the presence of fried chicken shops, and in particular the smell of fried chicken shops. And the smell becomes a vehicle for all of the moral stigma and all the kind of connotations and negative associations that we place onto inner city youth. And, and um, the smell, I think, becomes a proxy for that. Uh, and on the, the inverse of this, I think, is... Um, it, sorry, this is a, some wag. Um, did a map of the density of fried chicken shops and the density of coffee shops. Um, and put them over the top of each other in order to establish the most... Actually, he was doing it to establish the best place for investments. There's a ratio between coffee shops and fried chicken that says and this place is up and coming uh, and there's still cheap property to be bought here. And he, his conclusion was moved to Peckham. Uh, and Peckham has the, the, exactly the right proportion of fried chicken shops to, to coffee shops. Now, the smell and the senses do play an important role here. That's why coffee means something to us. And we, we, we're very attracted to its smell. Um, my point is, okay, my point is that these fried chicken shops, Tubby Isaacs, um, they are part of a particular type of very open-ended social formations that, where things can be added and become part of it. These aren't, there isn't an overarching sort of code to which Whitechapel High Street at present must conform. Historically, you've been able to put things in there, different smells, different textures, different cultures, different peoples, and they might not all neatly um, kind of uh, live in harmony, but they have rubbed along. Um, so it's, it's been a place of addition. Now, what we see kind of creeping from the east now is this, it looks a little bit like, forgive me, um, the men's uh, pharmaceutical counter at, at Superdrug, right? but it's the city, the city of London, shining blue metal coming this way. And it's what we're starting to see, started first with Toby Isaacs, but in, in the area around it, is, is the submission of the space uh, to a particular set of codes and, 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 and requirements, and aesthetic codes and requirements, in which these, these smells or these textures or these, even the lives associated with Toby Isaacs or the fried chicken shop have less and less of a place. Um, and I think that that is a serious loss because historically, you know, what Whitechapel has been is this incredible space of encounter, <coughs> albeit, you know, because it's marginal, because it's a cramped space, but it has been a very important space of cross-cultural uh, and, and very productive um, um, encounters between and across difference. And I think the senses have both played a very active role in that, but also have the sensations of Whitechapel Road as it exists now reflect that. I think there's a potential... I don't know if it's going to happen or not, that some of this texture, which is very important to the people that live in and around Whitechapel, might be lost. The sensory, the, the, the fried chicken shop, as problematic as they may well be, is an important resource for the people that use it. It means something to the people that use it. Tubby Isaacs was important to the people that use it. Um, there is less and less of a place for them in the cityscape as it stands, um, and that's... Um, yeah, we don't want to see Whitechapel being made to kind of conform to some external measure where in the past it's been some type of location where, where it kind of exists through addition of, of new groups and new things and new things together. Um, it's a little bit abstract and, and rambling, but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.